I'm running a little bit behind. We'll catch up at the next break. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was, uh, that was great. I especially appreciate the, uh, the gavel banging, the shoe banging image of Dave looking like Khrushchev, but making his point very clearly as always. By way of introduction, let me uh, let me just give you a little plug for the, the venture firm that Dave and I run along with Stephanie Shorter. We run a firm called Practical Venture Capital. Let me start where Mark ended on the secondary market. And he gave you the, a bit of a, a framework for how it works. Employees and early LPs invest in companies they invest at lower valuations or they they exercise shares and buy stock at lower valuations. Those get marked up. Eventually, those folks need money to pay bills, to pay taxes, to buy houses, to send kids to school. That's kind of the theoretical framework. The Let me make it more practical. This is how a venture capital firm works in real life. The first five years of a venture capital firm, as many of you know, are a bit of a mess. You invest in a lot of companies. A lot of the losers get written off in those first two, three, five years. You pull fees and management fees out of the fund, so that's front-loaded. Around the five-year point, something good starts to happen. Your winners begin to emerge, right? They get marked up, and that becomes the majority of your NAV. The values continue to grow at the rates that those Series B, Series C, Series Ds, winners that, that, they, that they get to. And around that five to seven-year mark, a lot of these LPs and early employees also need liquidity. So as a secondary firm, we step in, we buy those shares in a normal market, 20% discount, 25, 30% discount to where they're being carried. In a market like today, like Mike, Mark talked about, we're seeing 50, 60, 70% discounts to fair value. And so we, we jump into the midpoint of the fund. We ride the beta. When the IRRs are accelerating, we skip the J curve. So we get the beta of the venture category. We get alpha. Normal market, 20% discount. This market, more like 50% discount. And it's a shorter term for liquidity. So that's just a quick plug for our firm. Let me, let, me, uh, let me pull back for a second. And what I want to talk about today is the public markets and where we are in the cycle. And let me remind you that venture capital is a tiny little piece of flotsam bouncing around in a giant ocean of money. Okay, And knowing what that ocean is doing, and why and what's creating those waves and those cycles is really important to navigating where we are in this current business cycle. I I've listed a bunch of bubbles that have been created over the last 400 years. I actually remember, uh, I think one of them, the subprime bubble back in 2008, what Mark referred to as the great financial crisis, triggered in the US, but happened in a few other countries around the world. It was started by a subprime bubble. In 2008, I was actually alive and I remember that. So I'm, I'm probably in my 40s, as you can tell. I don't really, rem I kind of sort of remember the 2000 dot-com bubble. Um, I was working at PayPal with Dave at that time. I was like a junior itty-bitty finance guy at the time. Uh, probably too young and too stupid to really understand what that meant. But I do remember how it, how it played out. But I read history. And so I know that those two events are not the only financial bubbles that have been created. Um, many of you will recognize or remember the Japan bubble, which happened between about 1984 and 1990. Um, and I've researched bubbles going back to in the 1600s just to understand how these cycles play out over what time frame, why, what causes bubbles, what do they have in common, um, what do you do when you're in them, and, and how they play out. So I actually teach this topic at, um, at Harvard Business School now. I'm working on a book, which will hopefully be published uh, sometime next year, which you can, which you can read. Um, but let me give you the quick the quick synopsis of it. So there are a number of things that governments do which kind of create these bubble conditions. There's probably a nine of them. In the, in the Japan one, you might remember, does anyone remember the Plaza Accord, 1984, 85? Are any of you old enough to remember that? You guys all look very, very young in the audience. But if you read history, uh, we got one hand in the front. If you read history, um, you'll remember there was like currency manipulation and uh, and lower interest rates and things that drove capital flows have created that bubble conditions. Those are there's really two big ones, two big things that governments do to create these types of bubbles. Fiscal stimulus on the left, monetary policy on the right. Um, Mark alluded to some of this. The left-hand side is basically what happens. It's the federal deficit as a percent of GDP. Those red bars are basically recessions going back to World War II. You can see the lower that that line goes, the bigger the deficit created by the government. In 2020-21, the US government followed by Europe, 
um, and to some extent Japan, created deficits that were had never been seen before in modern history. Well, you got to go back to World War II to find those deficits. OK, at the same time, on the right hand side, the Federal Reserve in the U.S., followed by the ECB in Europe, Bank of Japan, Bank of China. They did something that had never been done before, except once during the last recession. And they, but this time they did it on overdrive, on steroids. They went and bought government securities and bonds and they created and printed money. The combination of those two things creates an easing of financial conditions. You can measure it in a lot of different ways. I like just a simple growth rate in the money supply. This is the US. This is what the money supply did in the US. For years and years and years and years, the money supply was growing by five, six, seven percent a year. Beginning around March of 2020, that growth rate jumped to 25% year over year and was held there for two years. So for two years, they were like growing the money supply at about 20 points over trend. That means they created 40% of extra money. Where did that money go? It spilled into the financial markets. First the bond market, then the commodities market, then the public equities market, housing, Bitcoin, virtual baseball cards, any asset you can think of, crypto, right? Anything you can think of began to show these types of bubble-like conditions, just like we've seen throughout history. And tech and the private sector was no different. We were caught by that as well. The money supply has now begun to shrink. This is the first time in the history of the United States that money supply has, has been shrinking for over a year. I take that back. This one time when it happened, 1933, that was the last time that the money supply was shrinking in the U.S. And if you read history, you know that 1933 didn't turn out too well for the economy globally or locally at the time. So we are still in those we're still in the shrinking money supply conditions. So we are still in a very challenging, tough set of financial conditions. So how have all these markets reacted? I'm just going to I'll go through a couple of these markets just to show how they've how they've risen and fallen during this period. This is a U.S. bond index. They were kind of phase one of the of the bubble. The blue line shows as soon as that that money supply flood started, bond prices shot up. They stayed elevated for about two years. They began to go down in Q1 of 2022 when the tightening happened. OK, that's the bond market. Next was the commodities market. Similar pattern for years and years and years and years. We'd been in a declining uh, a commodity super cycle where prices were declining. Right around Q1 2020, Q2 2020, they began to go up. They went up for two years, and now they are back to declining. On and on and on, we can go through all these asset bubbles. The top chart is U.S. housing prices. You can see how for years it was pretty steady. It shot up during the bubble. It started to come back down, but nowhere near normalized, right? That line on the top right doesn't seem to be still back to that prior trend. So there's still potentially a lot of room to grow. Bitcoin, same thing. Market after market after market. Now, this is a similar slide to what Mark was showing. What have, what's the private sector done? What are the, what are the public stocks done? And how does that imply, why does that implicate the venture capital industry? This is an index we track, a SAS index of 105 companies in the US. Going back about the last 10, 15 years, the average multiple, sales multiple, was like 7x, 8x, 7x, 8x. It got as high as 17 during the peak, and we're right back down to seven now. So this part of the market has kind of normalized. We're back to that five-year, 10-year trend. I think that's pretty good. Now, the good news is the SaaS category continues to grow, right? We've had lots of growth. They're more profitable now than they were five years ago. Their TAMs are bigger. The opportunities are bigger. Arguably, the technology is better, right? The software technology we're seeing and the advances in AI and other fields is better now than it was five or 10 years ago. There's also more money in the space, so we're better capitalized. But the multiples have gone right back to where they were for that five or 10 year average. So if you're a long-term buyer and you're thinking about investing in tech generally, in retrospect, it would have been great to have avoided the big bubble when everything was expensive to, his to historical average. We're right at or below historical average now. So that would suggest that we're back into a favorable buying market. Um, where are we on the venture curve? Now, this is the really interesting part for, uh, for venture investors. This is a, a line showing average round sizes for Series A companies in the US. The red is like a market a stock market correction when the market goes down by 20% or more. And that's happened. It's happened actually five times going back to 2013. So what does that line normally do during a market correction? It usually kind of goes flat, but doesn't move around a lot, right? It kind of goes, it kind of cruises through those 
red spots is a little bit of a decline, a little bit of a lag, but usually Series A valuations are pretty robust. They took off during 2021 and they're down 24% since the peak. So that's a modest correction, a reasonable correction. Still doesn't feel like these are cheap valuations. In fact, we're still way above where we were in 2020, 2019, 2018. Still feels fairly expensive. So to me, if you're investing in early seed stage Series A in the US, still an expensive market. But now look at the later stage market, Series D and beyond. These things have come down by 60% as the stock market has dragged it down. Very, very high correlation, almost a one-for-one -one drop with the overall public tech index, probably actually overcorrected versus the tech index now. 60% decline from top to bottom, cheaper than they were back in 2019 in just in absolute valuations and round sizes. So if we're going to invest, this would seem to be the place to go shopping, especially if you can pay like 2018 prices for companies that are now in 2023 with the progress, with the growth and with the profitability, that's a much better deal. This part of the market seems to have fully corrected. So that's where I think we're, that's where I think we are in the, in the cycle for venture. Um, the good news is everything's on sale and you can get those 60% discounts if you know what to look for and how to underwrite. The IPO market still very, very shaky. This is just IPO activity over the past few years. Back in 2019 and prior, we were seeing 50 billion in annual proceeds from IPOs. It got up to 150 billion in 2021 and then kind of went to zero. So we've had a year and a half with really no substantial IPO activity for tech-backed companies. We've only recently had three, maybe four IPOs try to crack the market. Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we had three major VC-backed companies attempt to go into this difficult market. And we talked about financial conditions being tight and money supply shrinking. That's ordinarily a really tough time to go public. Um, Arm, which is a uh, semiconductor company backed by SoftBank, they, they made it out, but are now below their stock price, their initial stock price. Um, we saw Instacart attempt a, uh, an IPO, um, healthy business growing, profitable, price and devaluation that was about $10 billion. They had done a private round at $40 billion. So they, are, they were pricing way down from the last price round. They're also now below their IPO price. The only one that's done reasonably well is Clavio. And Clavio is a uh, SaaS company. They're in the marketing tech space, very embedded in the Shopify ecosystem, growing phenomenally well, 650 million ARR, growing at, a, growing at 70% year over year in the last 12 months, projecting 50% growth, profitable, which you don't often see. And they did fine. They're the only ones that have done well, which suggests that's the sector. SaaS companies with robust businesses probably have the best shot for breaking this IPO logjam. But the metrics better be great. And so the ones that might be next in line would be folks like that, like Canva or Databricks. If you're a consumer company or in the marketplace space, that's very challenging. Um, one thing all these companies are struggling with is declining growth. During the, during the heyday in 2021, there was a lot of money coming into the space. They were all using that money on marketing, right? Those companies were growing. Their customers were growing. Well, now their customers are sharpening their pencils. They're cutting back on the workforce. They're tightening up on their spend. And all of a sudden, the growth rates in this in the public company SaaS index we've seen have dropped from 30% plus to low 20s. So there's a significant, so it's challenging to go and go public when you have these kinds of growth rates, but that's what the sector is, that's what the sector is focused on right now. Um, so last slide. So what's what do we how do we think about and what do we advise founders and investors if you're going to raise in this market? Um, it's possible. But given the dynamics we talked about and the fact there's still some still some room to go on the IPO side. The IPO market is looking better than it was six months ago, but certainly not out of the woods. Your company better be awesome on these key metrics. If you're a SaaS company, you'll be valued based on growth and net retention, your unit profitability. And the growth rates you want to be able to show here are like 3x year over year, gross margins that are best in class, your LTV to CAC and marketing efficiency better be really, really buttoned up. And if you're if you're losing money, that's okay. But the amount of losses or your burn should be less than your net new ARR. So we, we define that as a burn multiple, which we, we look at and we advise companies on and we'll coach them on how to get the burn multiple to a point where it's under 1x. If you don't have those awesome metrics, it could be very difficult to raise at any valuation if you do raise it all, um, but it can get done. On the right-hand side are the challenging metrics. If your metrics are in that category, your growth rate doesn't look great, um, you haven't gotten unit profitability figured out, 
your net retention is barely 100%. Um, your LTV to CAC isn't figured out. You're not going to be able to raise in this environment right now. So best thing is work. So cut your burn, manage your business, get your metrics to the point where you're into the very good or awesome category. So fix the business that investors will be thinking about. And that's probably the time to raise. So the advice to founders is move move from right to left. And that's when you, that's when you brave the market. Because it's, it seems like there's still going to be another six months, another 12 months, another 18 months of tough financial conditions. So investors are going to be gun shy until they begin to see this really turn. Okay, that is all I had. Thank you, Dave. I should mention that Aman went to some very overpriced schools uh, named Stanford and Harvard. And uh, the presentation you're seeing here is really cheap because Harvard students pay $100,000 a year to get the course that Aman is teaching. You got it for 50 bucks, I think. Uh, so consider yourselves uh, fortunate. And now you can put Harvard grad executive education on all of your LinkedIn profiles. Uh, we're going to take a break uh, for about 15 minutes. We're running about probably 15 minutes, maybe 30 minutes behind schedule. We're going to try and get back on schedule. Let's take a 15-minute break. We'll come back. Victor Mullis will be speaking at 11.15. Thank you, guys. <laughs>